Bob's Breakfast. Our contestant this morning to play Jokasaurus is Tia. How are you, Tia? Oh, I'm good. Okay, and how old are you? Ten. Ten. Uh, you have to tell me a great dinosaur joke. Why can't you hear a pterodactyl using the bathroom? I don't know. Because the P is silent. <laughs> That's a brilliant joke you're going to know without. <laughs> Bob's Breakfast. And now we present... The World Cup of Answer Phone Hesitation. This is a great game. This is based on pure frustration. You know when you call somebody up and you get their answer phone? And it's one of those automated ones, but they've put their own voice in there quickly, saying who it is. And then there's that gap before the beep. I think it's because they've taken a long time to hit the hash key or whatever the next key is, or they've fumbled, or for whatever reason. Well, that gap is what gets you the points in the World Cup answer phone of hesitation. The record at the moment is four seconds, set by Dave last week. Debbie tells me that this number is guaranteed to beat that four-second record, so let's give it a dial-up and see how we go here. Sorry. McHenman Ramp Services, Luton. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Unavailable. Record your message after the tone. When you are finished, hang up or press hash for more options. Eight seconds, Mick, you've got the record! Bob's Breakfast. Anyone who says they understand LinkedIn is lying. That's because nobody understands LinkedIn. You just try it. When you ask out loud in a crowded office, what the hell's the point of LinkedIn, I guarantee that some smug idiot will roll their eyes and say, networking. Well, I found out this week that that's the biggest lie of all. It's got nothing to do with networking. I can't remember what pushed me over the edge and made me join this utterly useless waste of time. But I think it had something to do with people constantly inviting me to join. So I join. And since then I get requests from people all over the world that I don't know asking me to connect with them. So I click accept. And then I get presented with a page of people I might like to connect with. So I blindly click a load of those as well. I've no idea what I'm doing. If, if I like the look of them, I click them. Uh, usually I click them if they don't have a profile picture, because I figure if they don't even know how to load a photo on it, they know less about LinkedIn than me, so, yeah, you get my vote. Yesterday, I get an email from LinkedIn warning me that my account has been restricted because they've had several notifications from people that I've asked to connect with who say they don't know me. Hang on. You're supposed to actually know the people you connect with. I don't know any of the people that connect with me. What's the point of connecting with people that you already know? You don't need LinkedIn for that. You just email, or phone, or talk to them, because you already know them. And what about these people that only want to connect with people they already know? Why did they join a social media site on the internet? If you don't want strangers contacting you, why did you post a detailed bio all about yourself on the World Wide Web? It's called LinkedIn, not Get Out of My Facebook. <laughs> Stop the show. What's happening? We, we have a radio emergency. If we're going to get on, the three of us here, we've got to work out some consensus over Twitter and the photographs. Now, yesterday I posted a perfectly nice selfie uh, of me and Amy. Did you see it, Chris Hubbard? I did. Yeah, yeah. it was a nice picture. Yeah, it, it was awful. <laughs> it was looked all right. <laughs> No, it didn't. What's what, the problem? what can you Look possibly think was okay about that? It was half past six in the morning. My make and it was no makeup. All these no makeup selfies I don't do. Double chin. There's got to be rules about photographs here. So <laughs> what are we going to? So do you need approval now of the photos of the selfies if you're in them? 
Yeah, we all need approval. Definitely right. need approval. Right. Well, well, that brings me down to the main issue then. Uh, mm. This morning, I was shocked. And you were shocked as well, Amy, when you saw this. The Twitter picture, Bob FM, has changed. So, what's it? The Bob first one Bob, wasn't Bob great. FM UK. That's how you follow us on Twitter. Yes, Bob yes. FM UK. I clicked on there minutes ago and went, what's going on here? <laughs> and and the, the, the picture has changed. It's the picture of us in the cafe down the road. <laughs> so I've just had a look. It's shocking. Now, my first thought was, the boss, Brett, what's he thinking? He's normally pretty good at this kind of thing, but does he like this picture, whatever? Turns out, so we asked Chris Hubbard, so Chris, mm -hmm. have you seen the picture and you went, yeah, what's up with it? You put it on there. Of course I, I put Chris. it on. I, I've been experimenting around with these pictures Don't each day. Don't experiment with photos. Well, we, we, you'll notice what if, if you What made you think changed. that was a good picture? Well, he's got all three of us on. We look like a, we're having a nice time. Like he looks really annoyed, and like he's looking at me like, "Oh God, she's talking again." But I'm in, <laughs> I'm in profile. I, it looks like I've got the biggest nose <laughs> for a start. <laughs> <laughs> You're drinking out of coffee cups, and I'm drinking a tin of coke like it's some act of rebellion. And my neck looks like it's attached to my chin. And then in the background, we've got what is that? A pie warmer or something? <laughs> <laughs> it, <laughs> ma it makes us look like we're we're people, you know, real down there with it with. We look like the losers on The Apprentice. <laughs> this is Bob FM. Talking about things that have been lost and found, I actually had something show up that I'd actually hidden. I met Julie in New Zealand. I was living there. And I met her. I'd already booked a holiday back to Britain. Julie's dad is a golfer. So he says to me, you're going over to Britain? And I'm like, yeah, yeah. Well, there's a golf club I'd really like if you could pick it up for me. That'd be brilliant. So he said, it's a ping answer to putter. So I go into this golf shop I know nothing about, and the salesman says, I want a ping answer to, made of beryllium copper. Anyway, the bloke said, oh, we don't sell many of them. We haven't got one, actually, in stock. I said, tell you what we have got. We've just got, this is amazing. This is a Palm Springs putter. And I'm like, right? And then he said, no, this is like, this is twice the golf club that the ping thing is. This is, this is the one. This is the hot golf club. In fact, you're lucky I've still got one. And he really start. he's, offers me this amazing discount and I think, well, this sounds like a great deal. So I buy it and think, this will be even better. So I get this. So I'm on the phone to a, from a phone box actually one night. So her dad's in the background and he goes, oh, put him on. So I said, yeah, he says, how'd you go with that golf club? I said, I tell you what, I've, I've really struck gold here. I found a better one. I found this Palm Springs. No, I don't like them. So I didn't tell him I'd already bought it, I said I'd found it. So what am I going to do now? I don't know. So I thought, I was staying with my parents. So I hid it in the loft. I thought, I don't know, I'd just forget about it. Stuck it in the loft. So a couple of years later, I've moved to New Zealand and I'm getting married to Julie. So my parents fly out for the wedding. Actually the first time, coincidentally, they'd met Julie and uh, her parents. They fly out for the wedding. My old man shows up at Julie's parents' house with this blinking golf club, he goes, hey, I heard you're a golfer, so I got you this golf club. And I thought, you lying git, you never, you found that in the loft. It's Graham Mack and Amy Stevenson and Adam Carter. How are you, Adam? Yes. Adam's ten. He runs a rival radio station in his bedroom. And uh, who's this? This is this, who you brought in as a special guest? My sister. What's her name? Emma. Hello, Emma. How are you going? Hi, I'm good. Okay, and how old are you? Thirteen. Oh, so on you're as, Saturday. You're as old. Oh, thirteen on Saturday. <laughs> well, happy birthday for Saturday. Thanks. So, what kind of brother is Adam? Um, he's good, but he can be a bit annoying. <laughs> is his radio station any good? I haven't really heard it because it's upstairs, and normally I'm All downstairs. Right. What's the deal, Adam? Isn't isn't she in your target demographic? Doesn't know who's it, who's it Adam, a demographic is people that you want to talk to. <laughs> He's yes. only ten, Graham. So Give it's not it's chance. not really the radio station for Emma. Um, no. Okay. Well, so, I'm just practicing. Right. Oh, okay. So, uh, and you're here you're here to learn whatever you can. Yeah. Okay. Well, there is one thing that you have to learn I is that when you're on the radio, uh, you're still a human being, and as humans, we have certain bodily functions that we have to, you know, cope with. A lot of them are noisy. And so, if you feel yourself going to make one of these involuntary noises, you have to quickly turn the microphone off. So, if you do, just wave your hand at me, and, you know, I'll, I'll make sure that we don't hear it. Is that, is that clear? Yeah. Right. So, Emma, when Adam's doing this radio station thing, what, what are you doing? Where are you? 
Um, I'm normally in the kitchen baking something. Ba oh, you're oh. a baker. You like to bake. Yeah. Yeah, and what's your favourite thing to bake then? Cupcakes, cookies. Cupcake. Oh. Well, that, that's that sounds that sounds pretty good. That's <laughs> Adam. <laughs> I told you to wave your hand! <laughs> Life before we had all this modern technology. Mark? Things like mobile phones and FaceTime. Before then, mm. you had a normal phone in the house with a cord on it. Yeah. And the two things you used to do is, one, you'd have a money box put beside it where your parents just put the money in to pay the bill. Yeah. You used to use a cheek a little bit out of there. And the other thing was, we used to put a a lock on it so you couldn't dial it yeah so what you should do is you should tap the little black bits on top and you should dial a number out that's right you should tap tap numbers out yeah so if you wanted to dial you know penketh 5338 which was our number you had to tap it five times then then a pause then three times then a pause yeah that's how you did it tap numbers that's out it, yeah, yeah. As, a, as, a, as a kid it's like being a spy <laughs> Bob's Breakfast. The latest news now with Chris Hubbard. Tesco, they're going to be stopping sweets and chocolates being sold at checkouts at its smaller stores in an effort to help customers make healthier choices, they say. Uh, they're, they're saying it would Look, take if, away... if customers yeah. could make healthier choices, yeah. they could leave the chocolates at the <laughs> checkout. Darren's on the phone. I've no idea what he's going on about. Greeter at number 50 that is basically been acting as the uh, secretary because she's uh, got all the computer and all the latest gadgets. Yeah, yeah. Um, she has actually had a response yeah. uh, from somebody at the council. She came round and showed me on her one oh, smartphone night. Like, yeah, yeah uh, that is and, good uh, news. Yeah, yeah, yeah they, they've, actually, uh, they've actually talked about the double glazing. It's taken all this time. I mean, it's been going for some five, yeah. six weeks now, like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and the council have always, like, had, had no comment. Yeah, yeah. And the Welling Times, like, yeah, wouldn't give us a reason as to why they wouldn't run the story. So it was all, uh, it was all like, sort of like up in the air for a while. Yeah, yeah. The burning it was thrown out onto the main road. Yeah, yeah. Right, uh, which was an eyesore, and that was picked up within 24 hours. So. Oh, was it? Okay, so things are moving along then, since you got in touch with Bob. That's good to know. Oh, yeah. Yeah, exactly yeah, that, like, yeah, and, yeah. Uh, yeah. We have had some response. I mean, it's obviously, you know, obviously all the responses, excuse me, will go to Greta. Um, you know, because she's the one doing all the emails and everything. Well, yeah, because that's, that's important. Word of mouth is one thing, but word of mouth is also important, isn't it? Well, exactly. Yeah, I mean, yeah, uh, yeah. but as, as, as for uh, them sending Serco round, like, yeah, to tidy up this street, like, yeah, um, I mean, that doesn't look like it's going to happen at no. all. Chris Hubbard, how's your news? There's a new gadget uh, that might mean the end to washing up called the Baker Dish. Uh, makes kitchenware out of bread so that it can hold all sorts of food from soup to curry. And then all you do at the end, you don't have to wash up, which is fantastic. What's well, edible bowl. Can, they're looking at making bowls and plates of any sizes up to about 16 inches in diameter. Uh, and then these can be eaten at the end of a meal. As long as you know... Because I'm sure I went to a restaurant once and I I had something that was it was in it was served in I think it was like a, a sugar cane or something it was like rice or something but it was in like a th and I thought the thing was edible and I ate it and it wasn't <laughs> <laughs> yeah I didn't what know was it, made out of? it was it was it was like a, a tube of a plant like but yeah. like a hard and I thought this is really tough to chew through <laughs> and it was like eating wood. And it wasn't edible. No. My mate in the Navy, his wife sent him a candle for Christmas, and he ate that. <laughs> he thought it was chocolate. What? It was a candle. It was a snowman, and he it was... He, <laughs> well, he thought it was white chocolate? Yeah. <laughs> because sure. Martin Roberts, my mate from school, he's in the Navy, he's, I forget where he was, he's on a ship, and it's Christmas Day, he opens all his stuff, and he's like... <laughs> Oh, great, a chocolate snowman, brilliant. And then he finds the wick about halfway through, he's eating a candle. <laughs> <laughs> and what's the most daring thing you've ever done? David. My wife asked me to marry her three hours into our first date, and we got married three months later. Uh, we've been married 23 years now and got four children. <laughs> wow. So what's her name? Susan. So what, where were you? What was the date? Um, we were just sitting in a pub uh, outside uh, St Albans in a place called Sandridge. Uh -huh. 
uh, Rides and Crown, I think it was. And she said, will you marry me? So I said, okay, fair enough. <laughs> so had you known each other before? Uh, briefly. Right. Briefly. We, I, I'd met her a couple of times in the previous sort of six months. Right. And you'd always fancied her then? Well, she had a good backside on her and a fair pair of boobs. You old romantic fool, you. <laughs> The latest from the Bob FM Newsroom, more at 6.30. Thanks a lot, Chris. Well, you had some problems at Checkpoint Charlie this morning. Oh, certainly did. They love their yellow tabards. But they we're they talking about <laughs> Old Nebworth now because of the sonosphere. I mean, we're basically in the grounds of the festival. Yeah, pretty By much. accident, yeah. um, Bob FM is in the grounds of Nebworth House and, of course... There are so many road restrictions and all kinds of things because they don't want anybody stealing the festival, I think. I don't know what the reasoning is. But up here, Old Nebworth Lane, there are a couple of bods there in uh, in yellow tabards. Uh, well, I've got some... a bone to pick with you about that. Uh, well, I, well, what happened? Just, <laughs> just tell me what happened. Right, I was driving around the corner, come to a roadblock where there's two guys in yellow tabards. Mm. One of them steps out in front of the car, so mm. I can't go any further without running him over. Mm. So doing the decent thing i do stop and sort of say look i work at the radio station down the road just let me through no sorry can't do that mate can't do it at all well it's not been a problem for the last four years no no have you got a pass well no no nobody's given a pass well can't let you down then and he wouldn't shift from the front of the car i was there for about 10 minutes arguing with this guy that i worked at the end of the road i said to him look get in the car with me i'll drive you down there <laughs> show you where I work. I'll even go in the building and then drive you back again. No. Sorry, can't leave my post. I thought, flipping heck. Anyway, they called the boss, head of security, <laughs> who, who then just said to them, oh, just let him down. <laughs> <laughs> Unbelievable. But all this came about is because somebody in a, in a low-slung sports car <laughs> put their foot down well, and raced past them. Yeah, well, you see, I came up, old <laughs> Edward, and I saw these guys sitting on these, what looked like school chairs, yeah. I don't know. Uh, and as I approached them, they both got out of their chairs and I thought, here we go. Yeah. So I slowed down, stuck it in second gear, wound down the window. As I slowed down, they walked up to the window and as they got to the window, I just went, morning, and hit the accelerator <laughs> and <boom> straight through. <laughs> What's the most daring thing you've ever done? Jane? Went up in a hot air balloon over Egypt. Wow! <laughs> wow! I mean, I mean, that part of the world, th there's a, it's a lot more daring, isn't it, if you know what I mean? It is. You know, you might hit a bit of flack. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get the news now with Chris Hubbard. Food banks are back in the news this morning. A food bank charity saying it's handed out nearly a million food parcels in the last year. You know, I've had an idea. It, here's, what, here's what we could do, yeah. right? We get a cinema to show us a blockbuster movie. Stay with me on this one. And this relates to food banks? Absolutely. Right, OK. We get a cinema to show a blockbuster movie... And we say to the cinema, we'll give you all the publicity and, and mention you and, and we'll fill a cinema. And we say to Bob FM listeners, you can go to this cinema on this night and watch this exclusive showing of this blockbuster film as long as you bring a can of food. And we have the food bank there on the night to collect all the cans of food. Well, that'd be good if you've got a big auditorium. I've got a name for it too. Go on. The Can Film Festival. Oh my goodness. Survey out today from Hotels.com talks about things that Brits will do on holiday but wouldn't do at home. Kelly, what would you do on holiday but not at home? Go topless. You, you go topless on holiday, you wouldn't do it at home? Yeah, it'd be a bit strange in Asda, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> now, do you have to be out the country or just at a holiday resort? Oh, definitely out of the country. Oh, you, you wouldn't do it at Blackpool. Right, right. So you wouldn't do it at a British beach. But even on holiday, it's kind of, you, you have to do it. As a girl, you feel pressured to do it because everyone else is doing it. So you think, like, right, what the heck? I'm doing it too. It still feels a little bit weird. I mean, for instance, I went to Egypt a couple of years ago and everyone was, you know, half naked. And I thought, no, I'm going to get them out as well and get them brown. 
And um, I remember a holiday rep coming over and speaking to me whilst I was topless. But it was so awkward. Oh, were, were these men or women? Men. No, I'm but sorry. Obviously... A, a man cannot have an intelligent conversation with a topless woman. It's well, impossible. Thing, if, you, if you kind of live out there, it's just the norm, isn't it? It's, you're just so used to pay, seeing women topless. I suppose it's just, it becomes, you become desensitised to it. But, I mean, yeah, it, it is very weird. I remember falling asleep whilst I was out there. And where we used to sunbathe, in the evening, they used to turn it into the restaurant. But I fell asleep. And the people that I was with had gone in thinking, oh, Kelly's asleep, she'll be in soon. They didn't. I think I woke up about 7 o'clock as they were setting up for the restaurant with people all getting their drinks for dinner and everything. And I'm lying there. Topless. Bad as punch. <laughs> <laughs> this is Bob. Let's get the latest news now with Chris Hubbard. There's a story in the news this morning about a woman who's had uh, plastic surgery to get the perfect selfie. She's had longer arms. <laughs> <laughs> We're talking about terrible jobs this morning. There's a bloke in China. His job is being hit in the stomach. He charges people to hit him in the stomach. So what's the worst job you've ever had? I remember I had a Saturday job at Liverpool Airport in the Argyle restaurant. I was a kitchen porter, which basically meant I loaded and unloaded the dishwashing machine, the big Hobart dishwashing machine, and I also had to scrape all the plates into this, what I thought was like a waste disposal thing until the end of the shift on the first day I realised there was just a big plastic bin bag under there c collecting them and I had to drag the thing into the lift to take it down to the... Oh, it was just horrible but the thing i found out i read a book about the beatles recently and it turned out that john lennon used to do that job he was a kitchen porter at liverpool airport and the airport the new liverpool airport not the one that me and john lennon worked in but the new liverpool airport is called john lennon airport They've named the airport after him. Which means the next airport they build in Liverpool, they're going to obviously name after me. Hi, it's Gavin from the Garden City Cinema. Can you help us out? I can give you a 360-seat cinema with a lovely film, nice Sunday evening. The film I think would be best is a film called The Love Punch. Uh -huh. A list of beautiful stars. Let's get down to business, though. You know, we have no budget, and we don't pay for stuff. It doesn't cost a penny, but obviously, the more cans they bring, the happier we'll be. Of course we will. All right. What night is the, is the theatre available? Sunday, the 18th of May, at 8 p.m. A nice Sunday evening film. Oh, perfect. Gavin, thank you so much. That's not a problem at all. Look at that. It's a happening thing. The Cannes Film Festival coming soon with the Garden City Cinema and Bob FM. Bob. I've been doing something really uncomfortable over the last couple of days. It's torture. You see, we've got this box of cassettes and they're all kinds of things from when I was younger, when I was in bands and stuff, and I can't face them, but Julie's decided she wants me to put them all on the computer, convert them all to MP3, before it's too late. You know, some of these go back a long time. And, okay, so I'm, I'm having to listen through t to what I sounded like, and they're awful. It's a horrible experience. But it's weird, it, it takes you back to that time. And there's one tape in particular, I remember when I was 17, I played it to my mother. It was a song I'd written called Lies. And I was really proud of it. And I remember she said to me, Oh, we could say we knew you when you were rubbish. And I was really upset by it. Well, turns out, she was right all along. <laughs> Bob's Breakfast. We're talking about dates from hell this morning. You been on one, Kerry? Not me. Oh, that's good! 
I don't know. I'm, I'm doing all right, aren't I, so far? They reckon everybody goes on a, on a date that they wish they hadn't gone on at least once in their life. So, unfortunately, Kerry, if that hasn't happened to you, you were that date. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God, yes! <laughs> oh, no. This is Bob. Phobias. What's yours, Amy? I have a fear of touching towels with dry hands. Touching towels with dry hands? Yes, yeah, so I can dry my hands when they're wet, uh -huh. but I can't touch towels when my hands are dry, so I can't put them away out the tumble dryer or anything <laughs> like that. So what do you do? Get a forklift truck or something? No, I get my husband to do it. <laughs> and what is it about touching towels you don't like? It's the feel of it. I just, it freaks me out. And if someone puts a towel near me, I, I kind of run away. So what difference does it make if they're wet? It feels different. I don't know. It's just, yeah, it's weird. <laughs> okay, so you get out of the shower and you're wet. So you grab a towel and that's fine. But after a while, when the towel has dried you, then you're dry. Then what happens? Um, I leave the tap running so I can keep wetting my hands, and then I can dry myself properly. So you have Except to dry yourself with wet hands? Yes. To hold the towel? Yes. <laughs> what a nightmare! Yeah, it is. I don't know where I got this fear from either. It just kind of happened, gradually happened over time. Have you ever sought professional help and, you know, you know? Well, I saw a counsellor for other things, and they kind of just laughed at me when I said about it. So oh, that's no. nice. Oh, yeah. that's nice. So you don't even know the name of this phobia? No. The, a fear of touching towels with wet hands. That's quite specific. Yeah. <laughs> Bob's Breakfast. Your date from hell story. What's happened to you? Hayley. I've done some internet dating. Yes. And the two that stand out the most is one person dealt some drugs on a date. He dealt what? He tried to deal them to you or he was doing them on the side? He was doing them on the side to someone else. Goodness, but how did you know what was going on? Um, because I was in the car with him and he, uh, went round to someone's house and came back with some money. Oh, all right, oh, that's a dead giveaway. How did you get out of that date? Um, <laughs> quickly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and what, what was the other date from hell? The other one was someone that was using pictures that weren't him. Oh, he so was in, his internet profile was, pic <laughs> who were they? They were someone that his girlfriend had left him for. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least he's admitting that she'd upgraded. <laughs> <laughs> Very much so. <laughs> Bob's breakfast. Phobias this morning. What's yours, Sarah? Orange peel. Orange peel? What's wrong with it? Oh, it's, it just feels disgusting on your hands. It's really... It, oh, when I was at boarding school, I used to actually pay people to peel my oranges because we had to eat our oranges. <laughs> And I used to pay people out of my tuck box so that I didn't have to touch the orange peel. Has this always been a problem for you? I don't remember when it started. I even now, I love oranges, but yeah. I have to get the kids to peel them for me. It's like, you know, peel a grape for your mother. It's, it's like, <laughs> peel an orange for mum. Now, is it the, um, the outside? The... No, I can touch. If, if, if I'm putting some oranges in the fruit bowl, I don't mind the outside. Right. It's that white bit in the middle. Okay. You, you don't like taking the piss. No. <laughs> <laughs> this is Bob. Talking about signs this morning. One of my favourites. I lived on the New South Wales Central Coast for a while. And there's a place up there called The Entrance. That's the name of the town. It must be an entrance to a harbour or something. Anyway, while I was up there, they made the main street a pedestrian area. They banned traffic from it. So you had this sign that said, The Entrance, No Entry. We're talking about a DIY this morning. Oh, and you're a bit of a dab and. What have you done? Well, I completely replumbed the house and rewired the house, but. Geez, that's right. a big undertaking. <laughs> yeah, it was. It what do you think fun. of this survey that's out today that says young men are useless at it and are more likely to get their dad involved even to change a light bulb? Oh, I fully agree with that. You agree yeah, with that? Absolutely. Yeah, they haven't got the uh, they haven't got the bottle to try it themselves. <laughs> Do you think men are a dying breed then? Because women are going more for men who use moisturiser and hair straighteners than blokes who can fix a tyre or you know rewire a fuse. No, blokes who can fix a tyre and rewire a plug and a fuse and everything like that. They're uh, 
they're far better than the boats. I, I know they are, but <laughs> but they're not the ones that are getting to breed. You see, you see this is this is Darwinian. The the men who are getting to breed are the men who women are attracted to. But women are more attracted now to men who use moisturizer and hair straighteners. They're the ones that are breeding. So future generations are losing the DIY gene. <laughs> Bob's breakfast. Went to New York for a few days. I like to go and see different places, but I don't like to get in there. Me and public transport, <laughs> we don't mix. In fact, the trouble started before I even got on the plane. 24 hours before the flight, you're allowed to check in on the internet, which I like to do now because it kind of streamlines things at the airport. I'm with Julie, and she's she likes to do things with me because she knows I'll mess them up. Only she's working 24 hours before the flight's due to take off. So this was a job I had to do on my own. Now, that didn't freak me out, because I've done this before. i got this app on my phone, and I've checked in on my phone, which is great. You, you check in, you, you pick your seat, you, then they send you the boarding pass, and it's on your phone. You don't even have to print anything out. And then when you get there, you just show them your phone, and you're through. It's fantastic. So I, I, I wasn't worried about that. So 24 hours before the flight, uh, the time's ticking down. The flight was at uh, 10 past 1. So 10 past 1 the day before, I had to check in. And, well, y you know, there's a, I know there's a bit of a race on. I mean, these planes hold, you know, close to 400 people. There's probably about 200 of them at least who are going to check in online. I'm racing against everyone else who's trying to get the best seat, because that's what it's all about. It's about the best seat. In case you don't know, the best seat on a long-haul plane is as close to the front as you can get, because that way you get off quicker, which means you don't spend as long in the queue. You've got to jump on the queue for the passport and the immigration and everything else. You're just that little bit earlier. So you want to be as close to the front as you can, and you want to be on the left-hand side, because that's the side the door's on. So the people on the left get off first. So that's the seat to get. As close to the front as you can get uh, and, and on the left. I mean, in economy, that's still only about halfway up the plane, but still, you don't want to be right at the back. So I'm sat at my, my desk here at Bob FM 24 hours before the flight, and I, I'm all set, and I've even got the app open on the phone, and it counts down. It, it, it's to the time when you can actually check in. And it's like, five, four, three, two, one, bang, I'm in, I'm checked as in, I've checked me in, I've checked Julie in, and then I go to check the seats, to change the seats, and we're in row 63. So, of course, I want to move that. The first row of economy is row 33. That's where I want to be. And I noticed that 33B and C were available, left-hand side, middle and aisle. So I successfully allocated myself to 33B, and it downloaded the boarding card to my phone. Perfect. All I've got to do now is do Julie's. And that's when the trouble starts. It wouldn't let me do it. It turns out that on those phone apps, you can only check yourself in. But if you've got someone you're traveling with, a partner, even though you're on the same booking, it's no good. So now I'm panicking. So I get on the work computer and I log into BA.com to go on there. So I checked and I'm there at 33B. So now I've got to move Julie to 33C. Someone's taken it! In the, in the time it took me to log into the computer, someone has decided that they want to annoy me all the way to New York. So I moved uh, me back and I'm still in like row 40, whatever. Then I notice that another seat in 33 has opened up. In fact, there's two there, 33D and E, which are only just across the aisle from 33B and C. So I, I quickly uh, moved me into there, I moved Julie into there, and we're all set. We're still on the left-hand side, only just, but just the other side of the aisle. We're still on the left-hand side of the plane. We're in the front row of economy, and we're good to go. And that's when I noticed, uh, when I went to the boarding cards, because I still had to print them out by paper now, because the thing on the phone doesn't work, because I needed two, not the one, it's got the word C-O-T underneath, and I'm thinking, what's that? Container? Oxygen? Tank? What's... It's cots. These are the seats that have the fold-down cots in front of them. This is the part of the plane. They put the screaming, pooing, spewing babies. Bob. When you embarrass yourself, and no one else is watching, it's a special kind of embarrassment. This morning, I woke up, I turned this new computer on that I've got. And I grab the mouse, I push the mouse forward, and the arrow on the screen goes 
down instead of up. So then I pull the mouse down and the arrow goes up. I go left, the arrow goes right. I go, I'm just like, oh, I can't work. I have to think it's like round the wrong way. What's going on here? Then I realised it's a cordless mouse and I've got it upside down. Bob FM. When you've had problems being understood, yes, communication breakdown. It might have been when you were on holiday or just out of your comfort zone and there was a, a misunderstanding. I remember being in Singapore once with two of my mates, a mate from Wigan and a mate from Middlesbrough. Tony Lynch from Middlesbrough uh, was the guy that when we got into the taxi at the hotel, he told the taxi driver where we wanted to go. Big mistake. We wanted to go to Chinatown. So he says to the driver, Oh, Chinatown. Anyway, the taxi driver took us to the Sheraton. <laughs> Nice to be back in England. I was in America. I had a great trip. Uh, Kerry's on the phone. You, you followed my trip through my tweets and my uh, twit pics. In, in New York, I saw your pictures of uh, Twin Towers and I thought, oh my God, I need to go there. It looks amazing. It's, it's a brand new museum that's opened and it's in the basement uh, wow. of where the World Trade Center was. I mean, it is yeah. actually the basement and some of the stuff that... It's creepy and morbid. Yeah, but I imagine it is. It's a lot like a, a Holocaust museum. It, it, it's good that it's there for generations to come to see yeah. what happens when crazy people do evil things and yeah. to try and stop it happening again. And that's why it's there and I think it's important. But amazing. Wow. Yeah, amazing. Was it oh, quite emotional? It really was. The bit that yeah. choked me up, that there was a firefighter's uh, motorbike. I don't know if you saw that picture. Yeah, I saw that as well, yeah. The firefighter, <laughs> he bought this motorbike and he said to the guys that he worked with, I'm going to do this up, and they all said, he'll never do this up. And he died in, in the oh. Twin Towers. And so the guys got together and finished doing up the motorbike, and the That's motorbike crazy. is there in the museum, and it's pristine, it's just perfect. And I don't know, of all the stuff I saw, and there's like fire engines that have been wrecked and everything, of all that, the, the motorbike, for some reason, choked me up, because it's about, it's about guys who are his mates going, well, what yes. can we do? Well, I'll tell you yes. what, we're going to finish off the bike. Wow. <laughs> this is... <laughs> What's happening in news? A bit of a terrifying story for a koala. Uh, a koala clung to a car grill for more than 50 miles after being run over on a motorway. <sighs> survived the rough ride with only minor injuries. This um, koala, who they've named Timberwolf, latched onto the vehicle after he was hit in uh, Australia's Queensland state. His only injury after travelling 50 miles clung onto the front of the car was a torn nail. Oh, which, isn't a, right. which isn't bad, to be honest. Well, I don't know. I'd say that's pretty bad. A torn nail. What's Bob doing? This really has... Well, started to get out of control. It's really easy. I recorded Bob doing something. You tell us what Bob's doing and you get through on the phone and you win. Cash. Now, we're not playing the game till later on this morning, but here's the sound. If you know... Now, I'm just looking. You know when people phone up, we get a, like a readout of all the phone numbers that call. You yeah. can just see when, when we play what's Bob doing. The thing just goes crazy. We just got this like log of... No Actually, I can click on there and call them back. Let me just call one of these back and just remind them that the game is coming up. Yeah. Good morning, it's Graham Mack and Amy Stevenson from Bob FM. Who's that? Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> of all the times you call me, I'm on the loose. <laughs> <laughs> who, who, who are, are we? Heaven? Who are we talking to? Mandy from Stevenage. Mandy. Oh, I've no. rung you so many times. Don't tell me you're ringing me about what's Bob doing. No, I'm not. <laughs> I'm ringing. Oh, thank God you're not ringing me to ask me what Mandy's doing. <laughs> 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 Bob's breakfast. <laughs>